what's the today's theme? It's azotemia and uremia, and we're going to compare them. These are crucial terms for you, and you should really know the difference. What is azotemia? Azotemia, and what is uremia? Okay, so uremia. Okay, so watch out. Azotemia means that there is an increased level, especially of two substances, bun, blood, urea, nitrogen. This is a American way how to say that there's increased urea. Okay, there are different different units, but I will stick with the American ones. Then nephrologists will tell you some other numbers, but let's stay with this. So azotemia means that in blood, there is a increased level of compounds, substances that have nitrogen in them. And basically the main two ones is blood urea, nitrogen and creatinine. Okay. Okay. So that's azotemia. And nothing else, actually. So, azotemia means there are increased levels of these two. They're increasing up. And it tells you there is some kind of renal insufficiency, very likely. But it's more like a laboratory notice. Because typically, with azotemia, you think of a patient that is feeling okay. He still doesn't know. He has a problem, maybe. But these are the first signs, in a way. Okay, so it means some kind of renal insufficiency. Shouldn't see. Okay, so these two are increasing, going up, but still the patient has no clinical signs. We could say that. Okay, so what is the normal level? What is the normal range of these two? So with blood, urea, and nitrogen, it's 7 till 18 milligrams per deciliter, okay? And for the creatinine, it's 0.6 till 1.2 milligrams per deciliter. But watch out. With blood urea nitrogen or urea, we can say, you know it's the waste product from the, from the protein degradation, okay? So this is about protein degradation. And the point over here is that actually watch out. If you eat too much of proteins, too much of meat, the bun and also creatinine will go up. So that is why, why you shouldn't eat meat 24 hours before any blood evaluation, especially aiming on the kidney function, okay? Also, don't forget that if you have a bleeding into the GIT tract, and now especially from the upper parts, you will digest the erythrocytes and all the proteins from the blood. And these get reabsorbed into the portal vein. So actually, mainly BUN increases, urea increases. Okay. And you can use this the other way also. So now I, if I give you an example, if you have a patient with no kidney disease, the, the function of the kidneys is fine. But this guy is bleeding, bleeding into the GIT tract. You can use this knowledge to help you to decide if the bleeding is from the upper parts. Because if the bleeding is from the upper parts of the GIT tract, then you should expect that the ratio of bun and creatine is going to be really high. And the number, the magic number is more than 36, equal or more than 36. So if there is a bleeding and the blood urea nitrogen is much higher than creatinine. The increase is much higher in case of urea. This could help you to decide if the bleeding is from the upper part. If the ratio is lower, you don't know. It won't help you much, okay? But this is the other way how you can use this knowledge. So let's come back to the kidneys again. But watch out with creatinine, there's something else. You know, I'm sure very well that creatinine is the let's say, the degradation product of creatine phosphate, okay, which is in muscles, and uh, creatinine is released continuously from the muscles. So to what this is dependent on? It depends on the mass of muscles you have. So the more muscles you have, the bigger person you are, the higher the normal levels of creatinine will be in the blood, okay? So muscles, 
And you always have to think of this. So a small lady, she's going to have a much lower normal creatinine level. So something like 0.6 over here at the lower range. And a you know, bodybuilder is going to have like 1.2 or even more, like a normal range. And what you have to think of in case of creatinine is also, and in case of both, but especially let's talk about creatinine, which is sort of more, if I should like tell you which one is more important in terms of, uh, you know, telling you that there's something really with kidneys, it's creatinine. Okay. The other one is... Uh, I would say it's sort of a more serious predictor. But anyways, where I'm aiming now is on the levels of creatinine and how they change, okay? Because, watch out, if something happens with the kidneys and they start to fail, with kidneys, it's like a late sign always, okay? So, if we have like days over here like this, is a zero day, first day, second day, third day. So, when the kidneys fail the levels of creatinine will increase day by day, okay? So if the levels of creatinine stay the same, it means that nothing is happening with the kidneys. But if they increase day by day, this tells you there's something building up. The kidneys are not able to clear the blood, and that's why this increases, okay? So let's say if you have a 0.5 over here, then you have 1, and then you have 1.5 for creatinine, so milligrams per deciliter, and if you have an old lady, tiny old lady, well, when she fails, she can have just a slight increase day by day or just by 0.5 or whatever. But if she has such an increase day by day, this could be already a full fail of kidneys, that their kidneys are not working at all. But the increase is very, let's say, light of the creatinine. This blue line, if this would be a, you know, like a bodybuilder, this wouldn't have to be anything serious. It could be just slight increased, okay? So it always depends on the muscle mass, okay, on the person, how, how much the person weighs and how big is the increase in relation to the person's weight or muscle mass, okay? So this could be a, already a full fail of kidneys for a, a light lady, and if I will put a example for a bodybuilder, he's going to start here and it's going to go much higher up. So this could be a full fail for a bodybuilder. Okay. So always, of course, there are certain levels of creatine. If you go over them, that it's obviously fail. But what I want you to understand is you always have to look on the dynamics of the creatine. And if it goes up from day by day, it's very likely a kidney fail. Okay. Good. So take creatinine as a sort of an ECG for kidneys, okay? But with this, you have to understand that there are no acute signs, basically, when the kidneys fail, okay? Except that you could feel or the patient could feel really bad, okay? But from the beginning, you won't know. Maybe you will see that he's not uh, urinating, but, you know, it's hard to tell if he urinated now or... With kidneys, it's always hard and it's always a later sign that they're actually failing, because if the patient should feel bad, you need some time that the waste products will build up in the blood, and this makes the patient having nausea and vomiting, etc., etc. But still, take azotemia as a laboratory sign, okay, without any serious clinical signs. In contrast to this uremia, uremia... Of course, it could mean uh, increased levels of urea, but actually it's not. It's not only this term. Uremia means that there is increased urea and you have all these signs I was sort of, you know, uh, trying to tell you about. So uremia means already that I have high urea, everything else is also high, and I have obvious clinical signs. I'm really feeling bad. I'm definitely tired. And I have many other things we're going to talk about now, okay? So uremia means that the kidneys failed, fully failed, okay? So azotemia means like, hey, there's something happening. I see it in the lab that the levels of creatinine and urea are going up, but still the patient is okay. Uremia means there are so high levels that he already feels bad. And the point is, watch out. 
Azotemi, and we're going to talk about it later when we're going to talk about acute kidney injury, is there are different levels. Like there is a azotemia, like pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal. So there are different causes which make the blood urea nitrogen and creatine go up. Pre-renal means that actually the kidneys are functioning fine, but only the perfusion of the kidneys is lower, so they're not able to clean the, the blood, and that's why these substances go up. Then we have a post when there is obvious blockage of the both ureters, for example, so that's why you cannot clean the blood, but still the kidneys could be functioning for a while, okay? And then you have intrarenal, well, there is an obvious ischemia and, and malfunction of the kidneys. And especially the difference between prerenal and intrarenal, first, uh, for example, if you have hypotension, if you get into shock, so first you have hypoperfusion of the kidney, so that's why the purification function is decreased, and the azotemia goes up, and if the perfusion decreases too much, you're, you're going to have ischemia of the kidneys, and now suddenly it's going to go really up, and that means like already intrarenal, intrarenal azotemia, or in all the terms, intrarenal acute kidney injury or acute kidney failure in really all terms, okay? So, but I'm coming to uremia. So, uremia means dialysis, okay? And why? Well, because every time you have uremia, you have high levels of urea with the, the signs we're going to talk to, you need to give dialysis to the patient. Otherwise, the patient could die. And watch out. Uremia basically means uremic syndrome. It's the same nowadays in terms, okay? I mean, you were told if the word ends with emia, it means like levels in, in the blood of the specific substance. Watch out. Historically, uremia means already the clinical signs as well. So it's not only about increased urea, but actually about the clinical signs. So rather think of it as if someone says uremia, he means actually uremic syndrome. This is a proper way how we use this term nowadays, okay? like during the exams, don't say that uremia is only increased urea. No, there are many things that come with it, okay? But still, with the acute kidney injury and chronic kidney disease, chronic kidney disease means that I'm chronically losing the function of the kidneys. Slowly, for tens of years or for five years, 10, 15 years, I'm losing the filtration capacity of the kidneys due to some chronic problems, okay? And typically, when the glomerular filtration decreases below like 30 milliliters per minute per 1.73 square meters, when it goes below that, the urea goes up and I'm going to have uremia, okay? So if the Glomerular filtration rate is higher than this. Normally, it's like 120. And when it decreases to 60 or 50, you rather will imagine azotemia, that there's increased urea and creatinine, but with no obvious clinical signs, okay? When the filtration rate goes below this, below 30, you should rather assume already some uremic signs, okay? But watch out. So typically... Uremia is combined with the term chronic kidney disease, but actually you can have, in some cases, uremia also during acute kidney injury. But with acute kidney injury, it always depends how big is the injury. It could be an injury that like, you know, for a while the function of the kidneys decreases and then it normalizes, okay? So you have a slight azotemia, but thankfully the function comes back, okay? Or if it's a really like a serious ischemia of the kidneys, you can really get into uremia. And again, if you have uremia, you need dialysis, you know, for a few weeks, whatever. But typically with acute kidney injury, even if it's serious, most of the people will regain the function, okay, of their kidney. So the function can normalize. But if there are some unlucky ones, they can also never regain the function, and this means dialysis, okay, forever. So, or kidney transplantation, okay? So, this means end-stage renal disease. That's the same, okay? 
That's the end stage renal disease. With chronic kidney disease, it's one way road, which leads to end stage as well. Okay, but this is like one way. So watch out in acute kidney injury, you can have an impact, you can be uremic, you will need dialysis, but there's going to be regain of function of the kidneys and you can live happily uh, again. Or the impact can be so big that you're going to end up on dialysis forever or till you get a transplantation. But what are the signs? What is the uremic syndrome? So once more, uremia equals uremic syndrome. And what do we have over here? Well, it's everything that is related to the increased levels of urea. So first of all, very unspecific is tiredness. Okay, that's very unspecific. But then, as you remember, urea can get anywhere. So and when the, like the crystals, they can crystallize like on the surfaces in the GIT tract and whatever. So you can have uremic, uremic colitis. This means that the person's going to have diarrhea, nausea, okay? So remember that. Then you can have uremic pericarditis, okay? So watch out, uremic pericarditis. And this pericarditis actually is special. We don't know exactly the way how this happens, but definitely the pericardium is inflamed. It has a connection with urea, but there is something special. And remember, we told you when you have pericarditis, typically you should see ST elevation in all the leads, okay? So remember in classical pericarditis, which could be due to viruses or bacteria, so in, in viruses that could be Coxsackie, viruses or herpes viruses, bacteria that could be tuberculosis or pneumococci. Okay, so in all of these like infectious pericarditis, you should expect to see ST elevation in all the leads on ECG. Watch out. In uremic pericarditis, there is no ST elevation. So although they have inflammation, you don't see ST elevation. That's very special for uremic pericarditis. Then what you can have is uremic encephalopathy. Okay. But these people, they can have many problems, CNS problems. So they can have seizures due to that. Epileptic seizures. They can fall into coma. Okay. Just due to that. Then you can see asterixis. It's the same tremor as you can see in liver failure, okay? So you can see it also due to uremic encephalopathy, okay? So when the kidneys fail as well. And of course, their quality of consciousness can really change, you call that delirium, okay? So they're like oriented and then disoriented and again oriented, that's delirium, okay? Well, what are more things you can see? Well, don't forget also that thrombocytes if the urea goes up, the urea packs the thrombocytes. So it will block the function of thrombocytes. So actually you can be bleeding more. Okay, you, you can have petechias. So you can bleed into the skin. It's the disorder of primary hemostasis. So thrombocytes are not functioning well. You can have petechias. Okay, and with this, don't forget, and maybe that's a new information for you, but with this, you can help them to, if you have the malfunction of thrombocytes, you can give desmopressin. Desmopressin is a analog of ADH. And actually, this drug also boosts up endothelium to release von Willebrand's factor. And this means that this can help the function of thrombocytes. So you can fight this, let's say, impaired function of thrombocyte with desmopressin, okay? Anyways, what is interesting with uremic syndrome, that uh, over here, definitely, there will be more bleeding, okay? But watch out. When there is a 
let's say in chronic kidney disease before there is such a failure like this, chronic kidney disease, CKD. So at the beginning of chronic kidney disease, sometimes you can have nephrotic syndrome, okay? And watch out, in case of only nephrotic syndrome, you are more losing protein CNS, remember that, and antithrombin. and antithrombin. So in this case, when you are not failing as seriously, like that you have some kind of, uh, let's say, glomerular filtration rate, which is like higher than this, than 30, let's say 40, 50, and basically if the chronic kidney disease starts like with nephrotic syndrome, on contrary, because you're losing more of these substances, you are in a thrombophilic state thrombophilia okay so these people with nephrotic syndrome first they they clot a lot so they're in danger of the thrombus formation of dvt and whatever if the chronic kidney disease starts with the nephrotic syndrome but later later when they lose the filtration they will turn into bleeding okay so first they clot if it's just a nephrotic syndrome but later when they fully fail they will rather bleed okay well, and not only thrombocytes, but also white blood cells, okay? So, like, there's some interference of urea and white blood cells, so, or at least during the uremic syndrome, so we have a decreased function of white blood cells. So watch out, these people, the immunity is low, typically, so they can have some outbreak of a cancer or whatever. So cancer goes up, okay? So risk of cancer goes up as well, okay? So some kind of immunodepression, okay? And still one more very important thing with the uremic syndrome, it's the uremic pruritus. And historically over here, this was about that we thought that it's only due to urea and its crystal that gets on the skin. And by the way, people who have increased levels of urea and are not going for dialysis, they smell. They smell like urine, okay? So in all the times, like uh, 50 years ago, 60, when there was not dialysis for everyone, many people were smelling like this and they couldn't get rid of that, although they, they were trying to wash themselves all the time, okay? But also there is this pruritus. And in all the times we thought it's, it's only due to urea, the increased levels, but now we think there are more substances that are playing this role of pruritus. So... It's better, now better term than uremic pruritus, it's, it's better to call it chronic kidney disease pruritus. Remember, there is a pruritus itching of the skin, serious itching of the skin, but we're not so clear now that it's only due to increased urea, okay? So those are the most important signs in the uremic syndrome, okay? So questions on this part. So, thanks for watching, and don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. And as always, check the description below for supplementary questions and other materials.